title of this show is Stethoscope. This is uh, first, really the first in a series of uh, video news offerings that Hawaii Medical Association is producing on current topics of the day here in the islands and those th those hot topics that are relevant to to our delivery of healthcare and medicine and I we have today our our uh, special guest is Dr. Kelly Whitney from Jepson School of Medicine uh, she has dedicated a significant part of her professional career to studying healthcare delivery here in the islands uh, with a special focus on doctor shortages especially in neighbor islands where we're really feeling the pinch these days. So I want to welcome her to the show. Welcome, Dr. Whitney. Thank you. And we also have with us today Chris Flanders, Executive Director, Dr. Chris Flanders, Executive Director of the Hawaii Medical Association, 160 years of service. I'm Dr. Scott McCaffrey, who's the host and, and will be helping to uh, be the moderator for today's uh, interchange and with a special focus on the doctor shortage as it relates to our islands. So I think we'll maybe kick the ball off with uh, turning over the, uh, this segment of the show to Dr. Withy. Uh, maybe uh, first of all, welcome. How about just a little background information on you? What, how, if, how long have you been in, in Hawaii? And a little background with respect to your medical specialty and what uh, to kind of bring us up to the present time. Sure. Uh, well, I came to Hawaii in 1994, uh, fresh out of family medicine residency. So I'm a family physician. But in 2007, I got my PhD in biomedical sciences and clinical research. And I've actually been with the University of Hawaii since late 1996, uh, first at the residency program in family medicine, then um, with the pre-doctoral training, the medical student training. And uh, in 2000, I took over a federal grant called Area Health Education Center, which is in 45 of the 50 states. And the purpose is to uh, diversify and increase our health professions workforce. I realized that in Hawaii, um, and uh, David Sakamoto, who was then at State Health Planning and Development, at the same time realized that we don't actually know how many doctors we have practicing or how many we need. So in uh, 20, 2009, 2008, 2009, we started trying to figure that out. And um, we have over 9,000 doctors licensed to practice, but of that, um, now that we've been able to quantify, we have 3,600 actually practicing. So a little over a third are actually practicing on the ground. Full-time or part-time? No, that's another, that's, other. that's another problem. So we have over a third practicing, but of those 3,600 bodies, there's only 2,800 full-time equivalents. So basically the, the equivalency of 2,800 practicing full-time docs. Um, we have seen ups and downs since 2010 when we started recording how many we have, um, but our best estimate is that we are 600 short compared to a population just like ours um, that would have the services of the average U.S. population with our characteristics. So it's a micro simulation model representing our population of people compared to the whole U.S. utilization. So 600 short. So you did, did this analysis, uh, studied the population, studied the actual doctors, or the entire doctor population. Uh, I, I mean, questions that come to my mind is, what are the rest of, if we have, how, how many doctors are licensed here? Tw 91, uh, sorry, 9,100. 9,000, but only 2,600 are actually practicing. What are the rest, what are the rest of these uh, caregivers doing? Well, <laughs> I think a lot of people want to retire in Hawaii, and I think that they dream of it and they get their license here. Our license is relatively cheap. We're in the um, lowest 10 states for license costs. Um, so it may be future retirees. It may be some of our docs who have retired but don't want to give up their license. It may be um, the military, because in the military you only have to have a license in one state, and ours is relatively cheap, so you might as well do that and you can practice wherever you want. Um, it may be folks who live on the mainland but come here for a few weeks and think they'd like to do some work while they're here. So it's not entirely clear because we don't query the ones who say they don't work here. Um, but, um, you know, it's So there. of the 2,600 doctors that are actually practicing, 
Uh, what have you found out with respect to the distribution of doctors uh, geographically as well as specialties, and, w and which ones are, are more adequately served or, or maybe not? Well, that depends on the island. So about uh, half of our shortage is in primary care, and half of our shortage is on the neighbor islands. So it's quite disproportional. Of course, half of our population is not on the neighbor islands, so therefore our shortage is much worse on the neighbor islands. And it's actually the very worst on the Big Island, um, followed by uh, Maui County, Kauai, and Oahu. Um, but actually, there's some areas of Oahu who have, that have significant shortage as well. Um, the west side of the island, significant shortages. Um, we know that over 700 docs who are practicing today are over 65, or I should say, they're 65 or over. So they are of commonly accepted retirement age. Of those 2,500, uh, 700 are, are about ready to step back, exactly. or are likely to, okay. Um, we're about one-third female. Um, and we have over half of our practices are small or solo practices, which are the most vulnerable in these changing times um, because of all the new regulations. And that's much higher than other states. And when we've asked two years ago, because we're collecting the data right now again, only 2% of our doctors do telehealth. So that's what we know about our population. Telehealth defined as what? Um, um, patient right. care using um, non-face-to-face methodologies. Okay, but uh, usually with a screen of some type or not just telephone. Would telephone be, advice on the phone be telehealth? No, not, technically not. not, not the model yes. that you work using on. some audio connection, I mean video. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about, so we've, we have this problem. Now we have a medical school here, yes. which uh, you're part of, integral part of. And we're turning out how many graduates? Uh, about every, 70 a year. About 70 a year of so, you know, fresh young doctors ready to go out and save the population, save the world. And then what's the breakdown on that? What uh, are those folks sticking around? Are we, I, I understand we're losing a, uh, I mean, I'm kind of setting the ball up here, but they're we're losing. Almost percent stick around. We have 95 residency slots, maybe a little more now. Uh, if they do medical school and residency here, we keep 85%. And that's the best in the country for keeping our docs mm -hmm. um, if they go to medical school and residency here. But as you know, yeah, a lot of students like to do one part of their education away. Um, so that might be medical school, that might be residency. Um, but I calculate we'd have to double to triple both our medical school and our residency training to actually be training enough to catch up. To catch up with the, the actual needs. And um, uh, over to maybe over to Chris Flanders here. Uh, what's what's the report on uh, down in the trenches here? What are you hearing from doctors with respect to conditions to practice medicine here? That that's a challenge for some of the physicians. That uh, we've always heard the complaints that reimbursement here is not what it should be compared to the cost of doing business. That that presents some challenges with a sustainable practice for primarily for the independent physicians but also for the larger groups that are trying to trying to form themselves so I mean that's a challenge and in you know getting back to Kelly's point about the uh, students who uh, stay here uh, ultimately the the challenge is when they go to places where they see that things are are a little bit further down down the healthcare care evolutionary trail that that that's new and that's exciting to them and, then, and so that's a draw too. So it's trying to bring, bring our students back to, back to, to the islands. That's, uh, is, is, it prior, is it the environment that they're, uh, they're drawn to on the mainland or better reimbursement or has anyone looked at that very closely? Well, I think it's a little bit of both because we see the, you know, we see the problems that students are having with the, the amount of student loans that they've got that it really does present a challenge to them to be able to pay those things off because essentially what you're looking at at graduation is a, is a mortgage payment before you even own a house. So, so that's one of the challenges. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. So we see that. But it, and I think part of it is also the, it, it's new and it's exciting on the mainland. So that's an attraction that you know, hospitals tend to be bigger and, and busy and 
the uh, the other thing is that it's a reimbursement as well because we know that based on the cost of living and, and even in real numbers that reimbursement on the mainland tends to be a little bit higher than here and we're seeing that on the opposite end of the spectrum with the physicians as they start getting older and they reach a point where they're starting to think about retirement they they look at their retirement package and they say, you know, I, I haven't been able to save up as much money as I'm going to need to retire. And, and I live on the Big Island and I've seen this with several of the physicians there that have decided to leave. And they do. They leave for five years, seven years with the hopes that they can put enough in their nest egg that they can retire. And, and some of them have come back to their credit. Some of them have and, and some haven't. I've known uh, at least in my area of musculoskeletal recovery and in injury care, I've known three orthopedic doctors in the prime of their practice, prime of their production years, who did just that. They've uh, actually, they, uh, two of them still live here, but fly to California, and they can make. I'm told that they can make more in three days of practice in California than they could if they practiced six days here. Uh, which uh, you know speaks to the uh, FICO schedule, which is uh, for such a remote island chain, the most remote island chain in the world that we're living at, is uh, I think a, a problem that we need to look at closer. Uh, the uh, as a territorial Hawaii had a much better reimbursement scenario, uh, as I understand it, and we qualified as a, a frontier and remote region of the planet, and therefore reimbursement was much better than it is now, which is a uh, the uh, people experts I talked to rank us at about 22, 22nd in the nation for fees. Is that in agreement with you, you two experts? I would say we're lower than that. You think we're lower than that? Yeah. I think if there's two ways of looking that, at that. If you look at just the, the raw numbers as to what we're paid for an office visit, for example, just standard number, you know, we're kind of in, we're kind of in the middle. But when you calculate in the cost of doing business as, as the cost of living, we drop, we drop to the bottom. I was approached, this was about three or four years ago, by the president of the Urban Planning Institute, mm -hmm. who was, uh, uh, figures out the uh, uh, cost of living with respect to buying houses and, and actual housing. And I, we, we knew about this physician shortage at that time because of your work, Dr. Withy. Uh, he said, you know, if you want to retain physicians, particularly out of training, uh, provide housing, provide cheap housing. And uh, that's really the key. Uh, if you're looking at the, the cost of a median home here on Oahu, which is uh, almost three quarters of a million dollars now, and with a, a medical student graduating with up to a quarter of a million dollars in debt, uh, there you are, you're a million dollars in the hole just to put a roof over your head before you even uh, bring home a loaf of bread from the practice. So these are, these are formidable economic challenges that I, I think we're going to have to address if we're going to even have a prayer of keeping up with the, the work, uh, Dr. Withy, that you've done in identifying this problem and the, and the depth of the problem. And yet the hospitals that used to provide some housing for their doctors and nurses have to use that housing space for office space or other purposes. So we've actually lost housing opportunities on all the it's islands. exacerbated this whole problem. Right. Okay, so what are some solutions here? Well, loan repayment. We're trying to do that. Debt, We're very hopeful. Uh, mm -hmm. or practice here for a certain period of time. Right. And we pay off your loans. And who's we? Uh, the medical school uh, okay. and hopefully the state legislature. Okay. I say hopefully. And you're, uh, that's part of your activity with the legislature, is it? To, do you have a bill going through yes, uh, this uh, upcoming session? Yes, I don't have the number yet, okay. but it'll be to um, increase the, the cap on um, what the Physician Workforce Fund, not increase the fee to physicians, but increase the cap so that we can get funds from other locations and we can actually spend them to match federal dollars that come in for loan repayment. And is that getting, uh, this isn't the first year that this bill is, you've tried to get this through, it's is that correct? Okay. <laughs> Have you had traction before? Is it always you well, coming actually, up against the Dr. wall? Well, got it passed two years ago into law, but it was never funded. Oh. A different bill, the Hawaii Health Corps. So what's with that? I guess I'm I just, uh, uh, politically, I mean. It was, it was never given any money, so University of Hawaii said, well, it's a defunct 
uh, account, so we'll just get rid of it. Oh my. Oh my. So, so all that gets to the legislature is not necessarily going to be reality. Right. Yeah, that, that's a challenge because when, as we talked about with our students going to the mainland, the hope is that we can bring some people over. And to do that, um, what we need to realize is that Hawaii needs to compete on a national scale to bring physicians in because almost every other state has shortage of physicians as well. Some more severe than others. Our hap ours happens to be particularly severe, especially on the neighbor highlands as we mentioned. So we've, we've got to be able to compete on a national level. Most states do offer some sort of incentivization to come and set up a practice and do that. We've I mean, those are those are kind of the the standard, whether we like them or not. Those are what's necessary to compete. So, what palm palm trees and beautiful surf and weather can only get you so far. That's right. That's what we've got, and aloha. And it goes a long way if you're from here. Well, it's I think a reason maybe most of us are I've, one reason I moved here definitely yeah. and was willing to well, to yeah. look at a pay cut. Yeah, yeah I think I think that's true. And those of us, yeah, and those of us who came from the mainland realize that. You come here for Hawaii. But if we could incentivize that in some way with loan repayments or tax incentives, um, wouldn't that be a little extra draw? That's, that's a great idea. You know, uh, Dr. Withy and I have been uh, discussing and uh, trying to breathe a little life into the concept that there are a lot of these retiring doctors, the six or seven hundred that are, that are looking to back away from their practice. And, uh, and just turn the reins easily over to a younger physician. Uh, we have, just for the, our viewing audience, we've approached two bank, two bank groups that are very interested. Uh, ba banks love loaning money uh, for medical projects and to doctors. And some kind of a leveraged buyout concept where a young doctor can, uh, can take over the reins of an established practice that's already up and running and going and, uh, and make it very easy to get in where the, the bank provides the financing that creates a modest annuity to the retiring doctor for a period of the bankers I'm talking to, somewhere between five to 10 years to help them with their retirement. So we've, we're kind of excited about the concept. The challenge that we've had is uh, how to identify those doctors specifically that are thinking a step in a way and getting them hooked up with the with young doctors particularly, who may or may not know what specialty they're going into. And that's something I, I've been meaning to talk to you about, uh, uh, Kelly, is the, that, that particular challenge uh, with respect to this concept. Well, they usually know in their fourth year sometime. So wouldn't it be nice if we could identify the students who plan on staying in Hawaii and get them connected to a physician in the specialty they're planning, who has a practice, uh, and who is thinking within the next seven years or so of, of retiring. And we can connect these two, the student and the practicing physician, such that they could uh, have four years at least of mentoring while the student is going through residency. So monthly contact maybe, uh, maybe in their fourth year of medical school, they could spend a couple of weeks working with this doctor, see if they like the practice, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, keep in touch every month by email or whatever when they come back home for vacation or something, stop in. Um, even if, uh, well, we, we don't really have moonlighting opportunities, but that's another way they could get to know the practices. Um, but then, as soon as they're out of residency, have a warm handoff, basically, have a place for them that they can ease into the work there. They could be some kind of initial salary set up and then they can um, take over over time, but they have a place to go. And that doctor has hope for retirement. Um, but what we need, we've got interested students, we need the interested providers. There's no commitment to hiring this person as of yet, of course, um, but we need them to want to mentor. Mm -hmm. And they'd probably need to mentor two to four to get the one that they want. Right, right. Um, so it's a bit of a commitment. Uh, Dr. Flanders, any ideas on how to, how to identify doctors in the community through our database that would be uh, are part of the 700, 700 doctor demographic that Dr. Withy has identified? So we, uh, by either by their birth date or maybe the year they graduated from medical school, these are some thoughts I had. Yeah, that, and that's absolutely possible to do. You know, and I think, um, 
in in the uh, the more rural areas, they've been open to to mentoring. So I'm hopeful that you know in the past when medical students came through, they've always had open doors for them. And so my hope is that if we were to if we were able to get something like this off the ground, that they would continue to be open to bringing in fresh young physicians and uh, and make places for them to go. So what we've got to do is massage our databases and yeah. to, to identify these folks and target them. Yeah, that's easier. Uh, that's, well, it's easier said than, like, yeah, like everything else, the devil's always in the details, right? Yeah. And then, of course, the other piece of that is, what about, uh, this This would might take uh, some very modest funding, just the, the staff requirements of, uh, you know, and some of the, the fundamental clerical uh, requirements of making something like this happen. Any funding sources available either through, what, the Hawaii Medical Foundation possibly, possibly is there interest in Jabson with uh, your colleagues and and possibly the dean or the... Or well, uh, the dean is always supportive of rural training. He hopes that all students will have an experience on a neighbor island. Um, that's one of his goals. Um, and my grant has money for travel in it, so we can get them there. Um, we can uh, do the communication with providers uh, who want to do this. Um, they could have a student for two weeks, a month. So maybe some assistance there. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, while we're on the subject, tell us more about this grant. Now, is this, a, is this federal money or local state money? Well, I've got seven grants. You have seven grants? <laughs> so you don't want to hear well, about I, them I all. I really like you. <laughs> Hell, wait a minute. Oh. First grant I mentioned already, the Area Health Education Center. It's a very broad grant, um, and it's got um, nine different centers across the region. Um, one is on Big Island, one is on Kauai, one is on Molokai, two on Oahu, and then three, four in the Pacific. Um, so there's an easy way to get people to these areas. Um, two, three grants are for uh, science teacher training, health career opportunities, um, summer camps, and actually a pre-health career core for students interested in health science careers. Any of and this is targeted to college uh, undergraduates, oh, high school, high school. High school, school through undergrad. undergrad. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. mm -hmm. And by the way, any school that wants to have a speaker on health professions, um, we will get them a speaker. We have a speakers bureau, oh. and any any health profession who's professional who's interested, um, we invite to contact us, um, and we'll put them on the list mm -hmm. to go talk to their high school. Yeah, we or help help. Exactly. But that a lot of this is connecting the right people, isn't it? Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. Then we have the loan repayment grant, which is two hundred twenty-five thousand a year from the federal government, but has to be matched dollar for dollar from local non well local funds. Um, so that's our problem. We don't have the matching. Then we have the Physician Workforce Assessment, um, which we put on the conference every year, the Health Workforce Summit. Which I've been every to, which was very well put on, by the way, Thank and you. very informative. Um, and then we have a VA travel grant to send students to Big Island, American Samoa, and Guam. And we have a public health center um, training grant that we're also a part of. So we have lots of different activities, um, but much of it is putting people together. Are you adequately staffed? It sounds that's a lot of that's um, a lot of administrative. Yeah, <laughs> I am advertising big, right uh, now. How big is your department? Um, well, this is a center within, or this is a grant program within a department, and there's eight of us. Okay. But my department actually has only three faculty. Oh. It's the complementary alternative uh, medicine department. Okay. All right. Three point something. And are you adequately funded, or is this something that, of course, are you, I guess that's a rhetorical question. Well, but, no, because but I'd if like to loan we're, we're, loan well, this is loan. what we what we have here with the stethoscope show uh, is a uh, you know a, a stage where we can are hopefully going to get our message out. Uh, we're hoping that uh, not only medical people, doctors, students are watching, but also legislators and regulators. So maybe take take this opportunity and, and let us know what you need, what additional resources you need, because obviously we've got a, a huge need for doctors. Uh, you, you know, the, the, the thing about that is you don't miss a doctor not being there until they aren't. And we've all grown up in a fair, until you need them, and we've all grown up in an environment where there were usually ample physician coverage. But the I think your message is, is Paul Revere, Ms. Ms. Paul Revere, that this is changing, and uh, it's, uh, we're going to reach, reach a tipping point where it's going to start affecting a lot of people's lives. I here on Oahu, where we're uh, doctor rich relatively, uh, relative to the neighbor islands, uh, I can't tell you how many of just my personal friends and the, the few circles I float around in that are looking for a primary care family doctor and can't find one. 
they call they, they've called several doctors who are, have closed their panels because they have too many patients to take care of and they're going now what do I what am I supposed to do go to the emergency room if I have a problem which they don't want to do because you know people for the obvious reason people don't want to go to the emergency room because you might see something horrible happen but nonetheless that's kind of the, the default and that's not cost-effective medicine in, a, in an environment where healthcare dollars are, are shrinking and becoming uh, less and less accessible. Well, I would say if there were one thing that we could do for this topic, money-wise, it would be 225000 of local legislative dollars that we could match immediately dollar for dollar with federal dollars um, and have about 20 loan repairs probably. We have Those seven right now. Are waiting for a match here locally. Well, but I wouldn't stop there. We need more residency training in primary care. So the, the two family medicine residencies that are in Hawaii, the Hilo and the Wahiwa, um, very important, um, very precarious. Um, we need, you know, we is need that, more uh, medical students. Is that where the main shortage is, is in primary care or specialists as well? Half and half. Both. Mm -hmm. And the more doctors you get to stay here, the more robust we can make our residency program locally, the more doctors we'll retain, which will partially at least address the problem. Okay. Because in answer to your question before, um, the things that draw people to the mainland, of course, the salaries, the new facilities, the hospitals they have on the mainland, the specialties we don't have here that they can't get trained in here. Um, and then when they go there, um, they get married, which is great. But it's better if they get married here because then they stay here oh, more oh, likely. Oh boy, right, I got it, yeah, yeah. Um, just, so, yeah, and so then when we recruit people, we lose about half of the ones we recruit from the mainland. Present company excluded, of course, but. Um, oh, is that right? Yeah, is that so. Is 50% of doctors that, that That's my estimate. End up going back? Yeah, yeah, within a couple years because, well, the pay isn't as good, the cost of living is higher, the schools might not be what they want, um, their spouse can't find a job, they're too far from family when their parents need care. Um, They're good as long as the kids are real young, but when they get to go to start to go to school, they hit the reality that whole uh, uh, challenge, of course, of public versus private school. The expense a year for private school. If right. you have one close to you, mm -hmm. another additional expense. So there's lots of reasons. Yeah. You know, the other thing that I think that we haven't taken full advantage of is leveraging those students who do want to stay here and make things easier. I, I do um, student applicant interviews for jabs and admission and, and one of the things that I pay attention to is when the neighbor island student applicants come in and a lot of them I think would be happy to go back to the island that they originated from. I, you know, I interview big island kids all the time and and you know, I know Big Island people. They they want to be on the Big Island. I I want to be on the Big Island. The um, but there's no real system for them to do it. So I think if we started working on the uh, the f as first year medical students, develop a program wherein students are admitted to a rural medicine program, given the opportunity when they do their clinical clerkships in third and fourth year of going to Hilo or going to Kona or going to North Hawaii. For example, going to mom ships uh, over time. Mm -hmm. Ships start start establishing themselves in those communities, and maybe offer incentives that even at that point of student loan, um, low interest rate student loans from the state or from one of the banks that uh, you know make make things easy. I think I, I think we could see success with that. Mm -hmm. I like that. We do have some students that know in their first and second year that they want to go into, say, family medicine. They're dedicated to it. We have a third year rural track, or a, basically uh, it can be a rural track. It's a longitudinal track. It's a wonderful program. There's opportunities, Kona, um, North Hawaii, Hilo, Kauai, um, even Maui, you know, there's opportunities to train there. So this could be a really perfect matching if we had the docs if we had to talk, so uh, so getting back to that issue, uh, Dr. Withy, what uh, for the for doctors that, that may be watching this show either on our website, uh, on YouTube, and uh, through other venues, what can you what can you say to practicing doctors? Uh, I mean, I, I'm just putting myself in that position, 
I, my only concern with having students come out is it's, it's going to be a little more work, you know, because uh, a new, new young doctors, you have to, it just takes time, that's all. It's an impact on your practice. Uh, what can you say about that experience that might ease doctors' concerns regarding that? And what, what level of involvement or c what level of commitment is it for the doctor to get involved with the program we're talking about? Well, first I want to say that being a mentor doesn't take a lot of time. I mentioned a couple meetings and then weekly, I mean monthly emails perhaps, just checking in. Um, that's the easiest way to do it. Um, have them come see your practice, come spend some time there, um, and then email them every month while they're either here in residency or on the mainland in residency. Better yet would be to have them do a rotation there. Now if they're a fourth year student, it doesn't take that much more time. It's actually often, I don't know, maybe Chris, you can, <laughs> you can say how long it takes. I know having a third year student probably takes about a half hour a day more. Um, These senior rotations, uh, how long do they go? How many weeks yeah, are they? Four weeks. A month. Mm -hmm. But they can do five, shorter. Five days, five mm -hmm. days a week. Five days a week, yeah. yeah. By the time they get into fourth year, they're, they've gotten pretty comfortable mm -hmm. with the whole routine and, and the handling of patients and, and what to do in given situations, so the time gets less as they get further along toward graduation. Yeah, so I'd probably guess maybe 15 minutes a day, but it's very rewarding. Um, it's, uh, they get you to feel more up to date in your knowledge because they'll ask you insightful questions, that's why, why the not. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. They can do literature searches for you. I mean, these are tech savvy individuals who, you know, if you have a question, well, what's the treatment for Zika virus? They'll look it up, or they might even already have it because they've just studied it. So um, there are benefits to the providers that do this. Um, you know, that's one of the big benefits is that when students and, and when residents especially come out of the residency program, they've just been through the cutting edge of medicine, and they bring all those new skills and that new knowledge that those of us who've been a few years since we've, we've been in our residency um, a few. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but you know they kind of lift all yeah, boats sure. with with their new with their new approaches to things. So it, everybody benefits. I like the idea of uh, uh, starting with just maybe a very brief exposure. Uh, you know, just getting people introduced, and then uh, perhaps the the doctor that's looking to hand the reins off can have a, uh, maybe a few different candidates that they feel might be a better the best fit for their practice, and kind of building the relationship. So that. That might be a way to take to take that on. And we do have a time between first and second year where mm -hmm. they do a month elective, and we have some who've spent a week on each of the neighbor islands just to experience it, or a week with four different types of doctors on Big Island, say. And it's been a nice learning experience for them, and that could be our introductory time. I mean, a week is not too long to have a student with you, even if they just follow you around, you know, and ask you questions. It's not too hard. Um, so that might be a way to start it. And it works well for the student too because they can get a feel for the practice or that kind of medicine. And, and you stay in touch and then they mm -hmm. say, you know, I'm thinking mm -hmm. about your specialty. What's, what's it like mm -hmm. about this or that? Or, mm -hmm. Well, there's a solution then. Or at least a partial. Partial. Right? Start. What else can we do? What else can we do? We could, we, could get the, we could get the status of Hawaii changed to a frontier and remote, get a change back. Uh, that's something we have to do on a national level, correct? And I understand that's no, not easy lifting. Yeah. Yet, I don't know, I mean, uh, that by, by increasing the fee codes here would definitely help people survive, doctors survive, and, and be able to stay and raise a family and so forth versus the 50% the revolving door that uh, new doctors coming out right now experience or th that we're experiencing, so. So there's a, there's a project, uh, I've, I have talked to some of our representatives and there's interest uh, in, in pursuing that. So we can put, put, that, on, put that on our to-do list. <laughs> yeah. Other mm -hmm. solutions? You know, I, I think uh, right now with, with the uh, health care reform and, and Affordable Care Act in swing, every, everything's in motion right now. So. I think that the culture is right and, and the, the environment is right for making some of these changes. The, the challenge is, is dealing with the cost, is we're trying to control cost of medicine. We, we talk about the um, 
frontier designation or the island designation, as it were. And and the problem with that is that Medicare is struggling to, to make their budget. So if we take money from, or, or if we raise money in, in Hawaii, we raise the fees, they've got to be lowered somewhere else, and nobody wants to give up that. So it's a win-lose proposition for another state? It's a zero-sum zero game, so a benefit to one has to be at the detriment of another. That's, that's unfortunate. We're, I guess we have to, what, some of our representatives want to give out Aloha shirts or something? We better... <laughs> if we want to get something, we better offer offer our congressional leaders on the federal level something in return. I suppose. I, yeah. No, nonetheless, we're a showpiece. We're a showpiece for the nation. We are at the hub. We're not the Pacific Rim. We're the hub of the Pacific Rim. And I uh, I don't know why. And I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. Why we shouldn't be become a, a hub for the entire Asian uh, this this the entire Asian and o Oceania uh, in medical. Uh, not just not just primary care delivery, but also high tech and uh, cutting edge stuff. Well, we'd have to invest a lot of money in that to be that cutting edge. Tell us a little bit more about Jabsum while we're on the subject. What's what's going on down there besides the alternative? I know there's research. You all guys are big on research. All yeah. kinds of research. Um, the the rural health initiatives are heating up. We're hoping to get more students from neighbor islands and to train more students on neighbor islands. Um, we're increasing class size up to 72. Actually, maybe even 74. Oh, we were at 62 a few years back. Okay, okay. Um, but we're kind of maxed out now. With, with respect to the budget or the facility? Um, the, well, both, both. actually. Both, yeah. um, and actually, even more important is the capacity to teach in the community. So the more doctors we have teaching, the more students we can take. So you're saying the faculty is a little bit stretched yeah. right now. Well, how about uh, a message to the doctors, maybe seasoned physicians that uh, have something to teach and teach. and so far, how how would they approach that? They could call them, call they, could call, they could email the dean, they could email me, okay. uh, W-I-T-H-Y at hawaii.edu, um, and I will set them up with educational experience, um, very much appreciated by the young uh, medical students. <laughs> And um, so that's one thing. Yeah, we need more teaching. Good. Kind of a unique community uh, model we have with the medical school, is it not here, where most of the doctors that are on faculty are also practicing, have either private practice or, or possibly employed by, by a larger group or something? Right, we have no teaching hospital, and it was set up that way, so we weren't competition for any existing hospitals. But therefore, we partner with all hospitals and all doctors uh, and all offices and anyone who will teach. Uh, we like to get involved in the teaching mission. And that works very well for the students because they get a very robust, well-rounded educational experience, hopefully including the neighbor islands because that's where we need them the most. You need more, more participation there. Mm -hmm. Are there salary positions or uh, I mean, is there salary associated with Not being more. a teaching doc? More of, a, more of a stipend? It's no, it's uh, more of a um, honorary. Uh, honorarium, okay. Well, there's yeah. no honorarium. It's more honorary. Okay. Oh, but, uh, is it volunteer? So uh, pure volunteer. Pretty okay. Much, yeah. okay. Yeah. What, what's the cutoff point then in terms of professorship or or teaching? You can advance through assistant professor, associate professor, full professor, um, if you want to. So at some point you get into a, a possible salary position. However, if it's like most. Hawaii professional arenas that it, it won't be able to compete too well with the mainland, I That's suppose. Mm -hmm. We were just talking about yes, that. Yes, unfortunately that <laughs> is true. So what if we were the most malpractice friendly state in the country? Are Might we? that are no we? we are not. No, you're not. Might that attract doctors here? When I moved here twenty some years ago I heard it was very malpractice friendly. I, I think it would, that physicians look at that. Um, I, states like uh, Texas right now are very attractive, and part of it is because of the malpractice reform that was passed there in 2003. Um, that, that's one of the factors that plays into the, into the formula when doctors are looking. Because when you think about it, if you're paying less in your premiums, that's more you, more you, you take home with you. So.
you know, you say it's not very friendly here. What what are, what other things make Kauai besides the fact we don't have a cap, perhaps on pain and suffering? Oh, we have caps. They just go around it. Oh, oh, oh really? And what what else makes this not so friendly? We have a medical reconciliation board, right? That medical that filters inquiry, inquiry board, mm -hmm. and that filters out uh, fr some of the frivolous cases. Yeah. But what you're saying that's not enough. Well, we still have uh, high costs for uh, many specialties. Um, we still have, you know, moderate rates of settlements and um, judgments. Yeah, the, the, the judgments here tend to be very high, one of the highest in the nation. Um, there are relatively low number. We're probably clo around the bottom third or so as far as number of cases filed per, uh, per capita. But the awards are, are near the top of the list. Mostly it's jury, the, jury yeah. settlement. Uh, when they those higher awards are usually jury, uh, go to a good level of a jury, or the judges are very friendly, or both. Well, I it's yeah, it's a combination. Yeah. Set, settlements figure into that too, mm -hmm. but, but those are based on what a jury or a judge might award if if a case went to court. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, uh, for my own specialty, it's not too. Uh, that's never been a driving fact or even when I was in, uh, in emergency medicine full time, but I, I, I guess that, that could be for some specialties. I know our, our neurosurgeons pay neurosurgeons pay upwards of uh, six figures, $100,000 just for their malpractice premium, and I think OBGYN is, is even worse. So. And ortho, yeah. All right. All right, other solution to the doctor shortage. Or we the got housing, it. The housing crisis. The housing, How are you going to find them housing? I, I don't know. You know, part of we can't uh, we can't house the homeless. That's part of the challenge when when you come here is is a married couple or or when a family makes it even tougher is that to go to the neighbor islands. A lot of the infrastructure is not there. Um, what was done on on the Big Island when my wife and I moved there is the. The hospital assigned uh, a group of, not really mentors, but kind of companions to be with you, and they took you around, showed you the, showed you the ropes, invited you out to go, invited us out to go paddling, invited us to the beach, invited us to all the different things that were done, and, and so you establish a friendship earlier on, and I thought that was really effective. That's something we haven't really instituted. Uh, on, a, on a large level, that was just something that, that North Hawaii happened to do. Um, but how did that address your housing needs? And that's what, I think well, that's the, the cost of housing, it's the big... Well, I mean, those kind of things, they are what they are, and it, I, I don't think you can expect it. I suppose, in yeah, coming yeah, out, and then... But if you, if you um, set in roots in an, in an area, in, in, in my mind, the key is to keep a physician five years. And once you keep them five years, they've they've put in roots and and they've made friends and they've set up their you know all their infrastructure as far as shopping goes and you know getting the car taken care of and, and those kind of day to day is things. That is that uh, pretty much with your study of this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have data per se to support it, but I think if they stay five years, that's well, the only, highly likely. The only thing I was going to say to that is that unless your kids are getting to the age at four and five years old, if you have start a family when you first move here, uh, at the five year is kind of a break point that people are going either I got to, if I want my child to go to a private school, I got to start coming up with some pretty good bucks because uh, a lot a lot of uh, folks don't want their kids to go to public school unfortunately and that's another another whole challenge i mean that's a really unfortunate but that's kind of a reality in the, in professional circles i know especially so yeah you know really when when a new family comes in the physician has got the least amount of problems with with getting acclimated it's it's the people who don't have that built in job and and things to fall back From a cultural on uh, yeah. Immersion and, and uh, standpoint, right? Yeah, we just lost a very important Big Island doctor because her husband couldn't find a job within five years. Yeah. And he, he and he's not a doctor. He was in another another sector. Okay, so that and that way the economy is uh, is uh, is a factor for the spouse, right? Then there's well, the excise tax. Oh, the excise tax. Tell us more. Well, we're the only state that has an excise tax on health care. 
So the only state that I know of. Do you know any other states with excise tax on health care? Okay, so 4.75 percent, whatever it is, 4.35. Four point i i i. Whatever. That's Four point ouch. That's a lot of everything. So everything. the doctor has to pay that on every everything they buy for their office, right? Probably even on the salaries that they pay to their employees. And then they're supposed to, they have to charge it of the patients on the cost of the service they provide. Right. But the insurers don't all pay that. So the doctor has to pay double tax on everything they do because they end up paying the excise tax mm -hmm. because they don't get it back. Have there been efforts to, I mean, any kind of vigorous efforts to try to get a little relief for the medical profession? Not that I know of, because it would cost the state too much money. Yeah, yeah every, every, year we, every year the Hawaii Medical Association sponsors a bill to waive the, uh, the GET on food and health care, but we've never been successful at getting it passed. If at first you don't succeed, <laughs> I don't, well, something strikes me, I think until we start getting a few, uh, few more horror stories about people not getting the care, unfortunately, I mean that's just kind of how things work it seems like in the, in the, the political realm uh, is, is unless somebody, there's a, a, a story of someone really getting hurt or that not getting the care that they need in a timely fashion, uh, this, uh, things don't happen, things don't change. Uh, yet I hear an anecdotal stories all the time. Uh, the but one, what, what did one doctor say? Pray, pray you don't get hurt on the Big Island with some tr bad trauma, because they just don't have the resources there. If you need to have emergency brain surgery, you're going to have to wait for the plane or the helicopter to come take you over to Oahu. So uh, you know what I, I say? Why why wait for the the, the tragedies and the, and the disasters? Let's get after this thing. Well, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we say that too. Kind of the joke on the Big Island is uh, when I have my heart attack, don't call an ambulance, call a taxi. Take me to the airport. Just, just get because, out of there. Huh? Yeah, the faster, yeah. You, the faster you get to Queens or, or a major hospital, the better off you're going to be. And, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a joke, but it really isn't funny when you think that the golden hour that we're all taught about is being so important with emergency care you you spend sitting in a uh, tarmac. Stroke, uh, a bad trauma, uh, a blood clot on care. your brain. Telehealth can take care of some of that. The Telestroke Network is doing a good job with um, you know, connecting with rural hospitals, but it doesn't work for everything. It doesn't work for trauma, yeah, it doesn't work for broken. Procedure, some uh, complex start, procedure, right, right. Does it start? We really need to expand telehealth. Yeah, I agree. But everything starts with a vision and a dream. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank both of you for being here today. Dr. Kelly Withy from Jabson, Dr. Chris Flanders at Hawaii Medical Association. Thank you all for joining us on Stethoscope. And uh, check in from time to time. We'll have new shows coming up on a regular basis. Mahalo and aloha. Mm -hmm.